Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome back to English 1120, War and Literature. This is our third lecture. In the first two lectures, we covered, first of all, the course logistics. And then in the second lecture, which was a pre recorded lecture, we covered um, a bit of an introduction to war and literature generally, the themes that we'll cover in the course. And uh, tonight, we're going to provide some background and introductory material to the study of Homer, about the author, about some of the mythological background that are assumed that the reader already brings in when they're reading the Iliad. So we'll, we'll cover that tonight. Before we get started, I wanna quickly see if there's any questions on the previous lectures and the material we've covered. Again, you can raise your hands or... or um, Not seeing any hands. Okay, so without further ado, I'm going to share um, a presentation that we'll use to, to go through this uh, introduction to Homer. So the, uh, what we're gonna cover tonight are, are four main things. So a quick quick discussion of why we want to study Homer in the first place. Um, and uh, so basically, you know, someone who, who wrote so long ago, why would we want to go back and, and try to read this, this uh, particular author? We'll talk, as I said, this myth, mythical background that is presupposed, we'll go over that a bit. I'll, I'll assume that there's some knowledge or that you can look it up uh, online in terms of the Olympian deities. I won't go through all of them, but some I'll go over some of the uh, mythological uh, stories that are assumed uh, the reader would know going into the Iliad. We'll talk about what's called the Homeric question. So the question of uh, is, is there one single author uh, that, that composed these epics? And finally, we will look at the genre of epic poetry. So we're going to look at what, what makes an epic, what to expect in terms of, of epic as a genre. Okay, so the first, as I said, we're gonna address this question of why study Homer. I think, first of all, the, there's this question of the enduring value of Homer. So I think we could um, safely say that there's a reason that these epics have continued to be read and, and continue to be read to this day because they continue to speak to readers throughout the ages. And uh, I would say as well that the epics are more than just, let's say stories, uh, stories about war in the case of the Iliad and, or about homecoming in the case of the Odyssey. They're also, I would say deep reflections on the mysteries at the heart of, of being human. And so notably what I'll try to underline when we look at the Iliad is the way in which the, the epic explores ways in which um, humans can search for meaning within the limits of mortality, within the limits of our finite existence. The other reason, so there's, I would say the first reason, as I said, they're, they have an enduring value, there, there's an enduring worth to them. The second reason is because of their influence, they, they speak to us in a continued way. They, uh, the influence of the Homeric epics is absolutely incalculable to later literature, especially in the Western tradition. And only the Bible has had uh, a similar influence on Western culture. So when we see plots and images and themes in, in literature or films today, any, any stories, they're, they're permeated with Homeric echoes. Um, at the same time, so in as much as what we'll see in Homer is familiar because we've seen permutations of those stories, I also want to underscore that in some ways what we're reading in Homer is quite different. So the, the epics reflect a society that's quite different from our own. Uh, it's a patriarchal society, slave-owning, monarchical, polytheistic. So there's a number of ways in which 
the epics are going to, to depict mores that are foreign from our own. So now, as I said, the mythical background. So the, uh, the story of this great war between the Greeks and the, the people of Tr Troy provided the uh, narrative framework for, for the epics, as well as for countless other works, including, well, the Virgil's Aeneid, as I note here, but countless other works in the Greek tradition, uh, works that both, both works that we have, but also many lost works. Um, I'll note that the, so the two primary epics that we have, Iliad and the Odyssey, don't tell the whole story of the war. So the Iliad focuses on uh, a crucial incident in the last year of the war, of, of this 10-year war. And then the Odyssey depicts the wanderings of the hero Odysseus after the war. Other epics that are lost to us filled in some of the gaps and, and described other parts of the war or other, uh, other let's say, events before and after the war. So there, uh, there are several of those epics that, that are now lost to us. There, we, we know that they existed because they were referred to in other works that we do have. Um, but even in antiquity, in case you're thinking, oh, that's quite a loss, you know, what a tragic loss that all these other great Homer-like works were are lost to us. Um, even in antiquity, Homer was already recognized as far and away superior to the other works. And this, this points to probably the primary reason why his work survived and the others didn't was, was uh, the quality of the works compared to the others. So it's not as quite as much of a loss as, as it, it sounds at first blush. Some of the, I'll go quickly over these. Uh, and again, it's not absolutely necessary to know every detail of these, these stories, but it will help in your reading of, of the Iliad. So uh, he assumes that the audience is already familiar uh, with, with the legend of the Trojan War and some of the events that, that surround it. Uh, primarily the abduction of Helen that sparked this, uh, this conflict. So while visiting Sparta, one of the Greek um, cities, this Trojan prince Paris, who plays a, a primary role in the epic, abducts Helen, the, uh, the, the wife of, uh, of Menelaus, and the most beautiful woman in the world, uh, according to these legends. And also we should note that this action of, of he's, he's visiting Menelaus, he's, he's uh, um, let's say, enjoying the hospitality of Menelaus, and he uh, behaves very poorly to his host, so to speak, Paris does, in, in running off with Menelaus's wife. So this, in, um, in Greek terms, would be a violation of the guest-host relationship. So they placed a high value on, on guests and hosts. Uh, so someone's traveling through a strange territory, you, even if these uh, people were strangers, you were expected as someone, let's say, who resided in that territory to host that person who's traveling through, uh, to provide them with uh, a place to stay, food, these types of things. So there's uh, this type of lavish generosity on the part of the host, but also there's duty of the guest to honor and, and, uh, and respect the, the, the host's generosity and to return that generosity in the future. So Paris does, does none of those things, obviously. And this code of Xenia is very important for in Greek culture. And note, note to the uh, notion of Xenia, and, and the guest host relationship for those of you who know about a little bit about the Odyssey in terms of the, the violation of that guest host relationship uh, in a couple of counts. First of all, the, the, uh, the, the monstrous perversion of it in the, in the story of the Cy Cyclops, who, who I, I guess in a monstrous way has, a, uh, has his guests as Odysseus's crew trapped in the cave and he devours them, but also in the form uh, in the human world of the suitors who stay uh, in Ithaca in Odysseus's absence, eating the eating uh, eating Odysseus's wife and son out of out of hearth and home, and uh, trying to um, 
trying to convince Penelope, Odysseus's wife, to, to marry one of them. Um, so there's that story, the abduction of Helen in the background. We have uh, the readers would have known that Agamemnon, in response to this uh, outrage, led a, a Greek expedition. So Agamemnon is the brother of Menelaus. Um, and so he's the, the greatest king of this uh, of this of these Greek city-states. They would have known that the war lasted 10 years, as I mentioned. They would have known that Achilles is the son of a goddess. A lot of people mention, you know, the Achilles heel. So that according to one myth, uh, uh, Thetis, Achilles, um, Achilles' uh, mother, dipped Achilles in the river Styx to, to uh, give him imperviability, but uh, held on to his heel, so only his heel was vulnerable. So it's not entirely clear whether that, that legend or myth is uh, known to Homer or whether or not it, it, it's in the background of, of the Iliad. It's not referred to explicitly. So uh, it could be that that was a, a later or a different strand of the story. Um, and the readers would have known that uh, Hector dies at the hands of Achilles and that Achilles was afterwards killed himself by Paris. So they know all of this going in. <laughs> Pardon me. They, the readers also know about this story of which, which everyone's probably heard of the of the Trojan horse. So the Greeks resorted to trickery, so to speak, after ten years of failing to to breach these walls of of, of Troy. They use the ruse of of hiding their soldiers in this in this supposed offering to the goddess Athena in, uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the hopes that the Trojans would bring it inside of the city and at, at night the soldiers could flood out of the horse and open the walls, oh sorry, open the gates so that the, uh, the Greek uh, returning army could invade. Uh, our only surviving account of this episode of the Trojan horse, horse is in book two of Virgil's Aeneid, Aeneid so we'll be reading that. It's a it's an excellent uh, depiction of the fall of Troy and um, and uh, highly recommend if you have to select a few things to read that's one of the the ones I would recommend that you uh, read for this term it's a very powerful very powerful episode in that epic so the Homer's audience knew too that after or during the sack of Troy. Um, the Greeks committed all sorts of atrocities and sacrileges. So, the um, uh, the killing of Priam, and we have a have a, a later artistic depiction of it here on the right. The killing of Priam, who is this old king of Troy and the father of Hector, the father of Paris, and many other uh, uh, sons uh, in in the Trojan army, killed at a an altar in his palace. So, you know, in this in this world, you know, you you seek uh, sanctuary at an altar or in a in a um, in a temple. And the Greeks paid no heed to to these uh, pious uh, shows of 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 seeking the the uh, sanctuary under the protection of the gods. The Greeks ignored that and and uh, killed Priam and others in temples by the altar. The murder of Hector's baby son, Astyanax, uh, by throwing him from the city walls. So this is presented in Euripides, the Trojan women. And the rape of Priam's daughter, Cassandra, in the temple, again, the sacrilegious act in a temple of the virgin goddess, Athena. So Athena uh, didn't take this very well, so to speak, in, in later legends. That's also discussed in Euripides, the Trojan women. So all these atrocities happen with the fall of Troy, and it's this, uh, it, it's the, the, the impact of, of the fall of Troy resounds in, in Greek culture, and, and in later references to it, we'll see it a couple of times in the Aeneid, we'll see, we'll see it uh, uh, a bit already when we talk about book one of, of the Iliad in terms of how later generations are looking to the fall of Troy as kind of a warning of, of this is what can happen if you don't 
properly defend the city, defend the state from enemies. You're going, you're going to lose everything that's important. Uh, you're, you're going to obviously lose your city, lose your family, lose wives, husbands, children, and uh, all in, on the pretext of, of horrible and sacrilegious acts. The uh, audience also knew then that following these atrocities uh, during the fall of Troy, that the Greeks return voyages home were thereby uh, cursed uh, in, in a number of respects. So Agamemnon was uh, returns um, uh, to his home, uh, hoping to, you know, hey, to, you know, hey, Clytemnestra, it's been, you know, 10 years, do you miss me? But uh, she uh, kills him. She and her lover, uh, Aegisthus, kill him and, and Cassandra, by the way. Um, and Odysseus, of course, famously spent 10 years wandering before he finally does get home to Ithaca. So all of these are repercussions of, of violating some of these secret codes during the fall of Troy. The other, the other story uh, that, that looms large in the background of the Iliad is the judgment of Paris. It was told in this epic that's another, one of these epics that's now lost called the Cypria. So uh, in, it's it's referred to, it's referred to um, probably in book twenty four there though I've alluded to those lines there in uh, the first bullet and uh, so in this legend the it, during the wedding of Peleus and Thetis so uh, the, the father and mother of Achilles the goddess Eris or Discord throws a golden apple amidst the three principal goddesses and the apple is labeled to the fairest. So the, the goddesses, Hera, Athena and Aphrodite, you know, bicker over who this uh, golden apple is intended uh, uh, for and they go to Zeus and Zeus doesn't want to touch this with a 10 foot pole. He knows when he's being set up. So he says, oh, he goes and finds Paris who's just having a peaceful little shepherding existence uh, in the countryside and says, uh, you have to choose. And each one of the go goddesses offers uh, a great benefit if, uh, if Paris chooses them. So, uh, so Aphrodite uh, chooses, uh, offers to, to grant him the most beautiful woman in the world. Athena offers him military conquest and, and prowess. Uh, Hera uh, offers him worldly, worldly power and uh, of course, Paris chooses Aphrodite and chooses chooses love and beauty, so to speak. This would have been seen, uh, to some extent, as 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 the least heroic choice, uh, as as the least noble choice. You know, if you if you could be a great warrior, you could be, you could be a, a great military ruler or a great political leader. And he said, well, no, I'd rather have a, a, a beautiful wife because of this, let's say, dimin diminution of uh, the value of, of, let's say, these private concerns compared to these other uh, public displays of, of virtue and, and uh, of one's honor. So now <clears throat> we've talked a bit about why study Homer? We've talked a bit about some of the stories that are operating in the background. Now this so-called Homeric question. So uh, what is this Homeric question? Well, the events of the Iliad and the Odyssey uh, supposedly took place in the, in the, uh, in the 12th century bef before the Common Era, BCE. However, the Greek alphabet was not introduced into Greece until the 8th century. So um, so they, during the Mycenaean era, so the era during which the events of the Iliad take place, so the 12th century and, and before that, the Mycenae Mycenaean era, they did have a script called Linear B, but that was lost in a period called the Greek Dark Ages, okay? Um, and Homer's coming along at the end of this dark ages, so a period where there was no writing, and then there's a new form of writing uh, that's reintroduced into Greece based on a Phoenician script that becomes the, al the Greek alphabet as such. And it's also the, this Phoenician alphabet's uh, 
closely related to the alphabet that we use uh, today. So what happened? Uh, how did these stories form? How were they composed if there's this several century gap between the events that are described and when writing could be around to preserve the stories? Um, so how, were, how and when were they composed? Were they composed you know, just in the eighth century, as I mentioned, or were they composed earlier and then transmitted? And who composed the poems? Was it someone, as I said, in the eighth century? Was it uh, a, a number of different people and they were just fragments that were pulled together? The Greeks of the classical period had no doubt about the historicity, first of all, of the Trojan War. They completely felt that that had definitely taken place. And they felt that Homer was definitely one, a genuine person named Homer was the author of these poems. In terms of the Trojan War itself, for a while scholars um, uh, felt that, um, that the Trojan War was probably just a legend it never, and didn't refer to any historical event. Uh, and then there were, uh, I, I'm forget, I'm drawing a blank on the the year of the uh, of the um, the uncovering of late 19th early 20th century. I'm forgetting the year now, but uh, uh, Schliemann uncovers these uh, sites in modern day Turkey that are that he dates to basically the period of 1184, the 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 the, the uh, supposed date of the the fall of Troy. And there seems to be some evidence that some sort of conflict, whether it was really about whether whether there was really an Achilles and a Hector and whether it was all over one stolen wife is doubtful. Uh, but there did seem to be this um, uh, uh, climactic uh, battle between large forces that led to the downfall of that city on this on this site uh, at, at around that time. So that's with respect to the sack of Troy, probably based on some sort of conflict that happened in the 12th century. Um, in terms of the poet Homer, there's, there's less evidence, even, even less evidence than that in terms of whether it was one poet or whether it was disseminated by several, um, let's say several strands of stories that were composed through the ages. So by the second century of the common era, scholars had begun to question whether the two epics were written by the same poet or even by one poet at all. So they, so they pointed to inconsistencies in the work and they, they asked some of the questions about the distance between the original and, and when, when uh, uh, the, the, the texts that we have. 1795, so much later, this scholar named Wolf published a book suggesting that Homer had been an illiterate bard who composed in the 10th century and that his epics were transmitted orally by memory until the sixth. So that was one theory for a while that it was, it was an oral story that was passed down from generation to generation of oral poets until it was written down. So, so that's potential, that is potential as a theory. So in that theory, uh, Homer was not a, a literate author, an oral poet. Um, the, the Homeric question uh, leads to, if we were to greatly simplify the debate, you could be on, uh, let's say, a couple of sides of this, two main camps of this debate, the Unitarians and the analysts. So, uh, so the Unitarians are, are ones that say that if you look at the poem, there's signs of design and signs that there's uh, an intention at work, a poetic genius, so to speak, at work behind the scenes, crafting it, an integrated whole. The analysts, uh, from the root for analyze to break apart, uh, they feel that the poems contain too many discrepancies and that they lack unity. And they probably reflect the joining together of different narratives. So I tend toward the Unitarian side of that discussion just for your information in terms of where my bias will be when I'm presenting the material. I, I tend to see larger design and we'll even, um, even in the discussion of book one, we'll, we'll see uh, 
what's, what's described as a ring composition there in, in book one, this kind of symmetry of, of parallel episodes that you see there. And I think that's too, it's too obvious and too prevalent for that to be random. So there must, I, I would say, some be some sort of authorial design there. So uh, kind of a breakthrough in terms of the Homeric question came along with this uh, American scholar named Milman Perry, uh, who, uh, who in, in 28 uh, published research on um, oral poetry that he had been doing. Um, so he, he, he's basically uh, trying to get, a, uh, trying to, let's say, get to the bottom of how uh, this oral tradition could work and, and people are wrestling with, okay, well, if, if someone composed this, these epics, the, these epics are so long, how did anyone memorize all these to, to, in that oral period before they were written down? Like, you know, I have hard enough time memorizing a grocery list, let alone uh, an epic that, that, that is that long, you know, uh, uh, tens of thousands of lines long. How is that happening? So Milman Perry's, uh, um, uh, kind of breakthrough was was to show the techniques of oral poetry. Or it's not about let's say memorizing every line. Uh, it was about uh, obviously having a shape of a story, but uh, reshaping the story for for different settings and using familiar formulas and epithets. So so a formula for, for Perry was a group of words which are regularly employed under the same metrical conditions to express a certain idea. So, so, so the big challenge of the oral poet, you know, you're coming along and if you don't have the whole thing all memorized, how are you doing this? It's like some sort of, you know, hip hop artist just ad living, you know, at the spot, how do they do those things? So here the oral poet is saying, okay, well, I've got whole episodes where I kind of know what I want to say basically, and when I plug in this character, if I'm talking about this character, I know if I need um, if I need five syllables, I'll call call him Achilles the fleet or Achilles fleet of foot or whatever that fits into that line. If if to complete the line, I only need three syllables, I'll call him Achilles. You know that type of thing. So so he showed with great consistency how these formulae would show up at different points, depending on the meter, less so, uh, they're less directly attributable to the actual action of the character. It's not tied to the story, let us say, it's tied to the meter that the, po the poet needs. So the point being there that, that the, these oral form formulaic compositions, so if, if you're doing it in this tradition, you're not memorizing the entire production, you're uh, formulating as you go, but you're basing it on these kind of stock epithets and formulas that you can plug in in certain spots where you, where you need them. So Perry had discovered this by, by studying Slavic bards or guslars working in the oral tradition in, in, in what today is Bosnia, so these, so, so the other, so there's these formulas, but there's also type scenes. So arming of a, of a warrior is a type scene. So you can basically have the same description of putting on the armor, whether it's Agamemnon or Achilles or, or one of the Trojans that can be almost plugged in line for line with, uh, with the next episode. And all of that, as I said, explaining how an oral tradition could preserve an original story Without, without having to, let's say, memorize tens of thousands of lines. So I talked about a few periods there to describe what was going on around the Homeric question. So I thought I'd visualize for us all here what exactly I was describing. <clears throat> so the Neolithic period, the Neolithic, that's a new, new Stone Age, right? Uh, is, uh, is a period between uh, the, the first agricultural um, agricultural villages, so, so between, let's say, the uh, institution of agriculture in Greece to the Bronze Age, so 7,000 to 3,000 BCE. And the Bronze Age, as you say, see here, from around 3,300 to 1150 uh, BCE. 
And the events of the Trojan War uh, occur in the late Bronze Age. So within the Bronze Age, we had a, a period of Minoan ascendancy. So the, the Minoan culture in Crete, uh, the Cycladic uh, period, and then this Mycenaean period. So the Mycenaean period uh, where the, the dominant city seems to have been Mycenae, which is uh, the, the home of Agamemnon uh, in the story, but also historically. And uh, it's in that period that the Trojan War seems to have taken place. Now, this is just before what is not just in Greece, but also uh, in the Near East on the, uh, on, the, um, the, uh, on the Eastern shores of the Mediterranean as well, is referred to as the Late Bronze Age Collapse. So Bronze Age civilizations thriving in the region at this point. And then probably due to, uh, uh, to aggressive migration uh, uh, from, uh, from, uh, from Eastern Europe, there seems to have been a collapse of these of, of trade and of, of these city uh, of these city states. As I mentioned, Greece uh, lost their knowledge of writing at this time because, uh, let's say, civilized exchange had uh, had uh, decayed to such a point where it was no longer profitable to do that. Um, so you have a period of about 400 years there of what's, what's often referred to as the Greek Dark Ages, and Homer's composing the Iliad at the tail end of those Greek Dark Ages, according to current theories, probably around 750 before the Common Era. Now, according to the common, the current theories, it's not entirely clear whether Homer was composing using writing, or maybe Homer was an oral poet, and that the newly introduced writing, someone came along who could write and said, hey, Homer, why don't you sit down with me for a few nights and tell that story you keep telling and I'll write it down for you or some sort of uh, interaction like that. No one knows, we'll probably never know. Uh, and then after this period that's called usually the archaic period, just because it precedes the classical period, we have uh, the classical period of, of literature, philosophy in, in, in Greece. Uh, so we have, have the, the, the tragedies of Aeschylus, we have the, um, we have the, uh, uh, the comedies of Aristophanes, we have, we have Pericles, the orator, we have philosophy, first, first birth of science, etc. So in that kind of important period. Um, So we've talked about why study Homer. We've talked about some of the mythological background that you need to keep in mind as we read the, the poem. And now let's talk about the genre. So, so what do I mean by genre? So genre is, uh, is the base, is the kind, it's the type of work that it is. And, and going in, we always have, let's say expectations or conventions when we encounter a, a genre. So when we, uh, so, and this is maybe a dated example, cause I don't know if people watch these anymore. I don't know if they make these really anymore, but back when I was uh, a kid, they'd always have these TV shows called uh, situation comedies, right? Do they, do we, do they still have sit sitcoms today? I haven't seen them too recently. But um, so in these sitcoms, there are certain conventions, right? So when I'm watching that show, I know that it's going to be about half an hour. I know that there's going to be about 20 seconds of dialogue punctuated by a joke. And there'll be, you know, kind of a applause and laughter in the background. And I know that there's going to be some sort of um, kind of relatively benign, not, not life-threatening confusion and conflict that will be resolved by the end of the episode. So I know all of that's gonna happen. And maybe the sitcom, it's maybe it's, it's, it's a family, maybe it's a bunch of friends as in that sitcom called Friends, a, a classic of the genre. So, so in that genre, I have those expectations. Someone saying, unfortunately, sitcoms still exist. It's true, yeah. They, it is a genre that has exhausted itself. That's true. So, um, but all that to say, and I guess the same with, you know, let's say genres of song, those types of things. So there, it's a, let's say a poetic or, uh, or narrative form where uh, you, where it sets up certain conventional expectations on the part of the audience. So what are the expectations when it comes to epic poetry? So, 
So um, an epic is a kind of by the bare, bare minimum definition, a long narrative poem. So it's long, it's, you know, it's not a short work. So unfortunately for you, and as I said, as I said, I haven't asked that you read all of these long epics, just um, a couple of books that we'll look in and I'll, I'll try to fill in the blanks, but they're, they're longer works. And within the tradition, uh, epic, um, well, epic has a lot of different connotations for us today. Epic can mean just big, right? Like, oh, that was epic or, you know, kind of uh, larger than, than life and to some extent. Within the tradition, because it was long and would encompass a lot of dimensions of the story, it came to have this sense of encompassing in an encyclopedic sense, the elements, the important elements of that culture, okay? It, it, it kind of wrapped up that culture in, and provided it with a unifying vision, so to speak, of what was important to that culture, what's, what's to be valued in that culture. So it's, it's narrative, so it's, so for point one, it's long, not short. It's narrative, that means it's not lyrical poetry, which is most often uh, shorter and focused on, rather than being a story, it's focused on a moment, uh, a point of perception of an individual and experience and and lyric for that reason it's it's usually used and because it focuses on the experience of the individual often it's uh, used to express you know a, a moment of interaction of of lover and love object or what have you devoid of action or story so in Greek that's mythos um, and it's not dramatic okay so a narrative uh, poem is is one where there's a narrator telling you this happened and then he said this okay so the narrator there'll be quotes in there but the narrator is introducing it with a speech tag as opposed to a dramatic uh, a dramatic poem or a, or a drama where we actually have characters speaking uh, themselves. And it's a poem, so it's in highly structured lines as opposed to prose. <laughs> a couple of other conventions to keep in mind with these epics, they begin in medias res, so in the midst of things or in the middle of things, in the middle of the story, often they do. Um, and they, well, they can start in the middle of things because they assume that you know where you are in the story. They, they assume that you know the story, but also they start in the middle of things because um, I think one way of looking at it is it's the way we find ourselves in our everyday existence. So in, in a sense, we're always also telling an epic tale of our own existence. We're tell, we start in the middle of things and we start in the now and, and we have to kind of project forward to a goal. And, you know, I'm, I'm in this class now, I'm taking this class and Professor Wilson's talking about immediate rest and I don't know what that means and what am I doing here? And then you go, oh, I know what I'm doing, I gotta get this credit and then I gotta get my degree and then I gotta get a job and then I got to go out and I got to get whatever else, right? And then, so that's the projecting forward. And then you also look back from the, the present, the now, and, and you say, okay, well, I, and I got here through a lot of great, great events and it was uh, quite a harrowing tale. And I had to defeat a Cyclops, which was at the bus station. And, and now I'm here. So in that, in, in those kind of, say day-to-day -day interactions we're also living our lives as a kind of as I said epic narrative of temporally projecting forward and looking back and trying to draw unity in it okay so so too here the epic is taking all of the history of a culture throwing the reader at one kind of crucial moment in that history of a culture and saying okay I can look forward and backward and show you how that really unites and brings meaning to all of our lives and all of our culture at, at that one moment. Um, and for, for Homer in the Iliad, that moment is this conflict of Achilles and Agamemnon. So he's gonna show how everything that's at stake for, for that culture and for humans as such can be seen in that struggle. And, and if we tie in what's gonna happen after and, and, we, and we relate back what happens before, 
you're going to see not only the kind of the unity of general human existence, but also how the stories and myths that the Greeks tell themselves make sense in that whole. A similar structure of starting in the middle of things and looking forward and back happens, of course, in the Odyssey. So he begins in the middle of things and we only find out the, you know, the famous, the most famous part of the Odyssey is Odysseus's various travels. And I mentioned the Cyclops already. The Cyclops are not mentioned until the narrative portion of book nine through 12. So it starts much later than that. And Odysseus tells us about these wanderings uh, in this narrated portion that he gives to the Phaeacians. So too, a very similar structure with the Aeneid and with Paradise Lost. What, what, one of the greatest books ever written, by the way, where it's not on our course, the Paradise Lost, but if you do have a chance to read any book, maybe this summer you're sitting there going, oh, I need to read a book this summer on the beach. Maybe it's not good beach reading, but uh, check that out. Trust me. Okay, so the other convention I want to highlight is the epic invocation, so, uh, invocation of the muse to tell, to to guide the poet to tell this story that is so beyond their experience. So, so uh, the invocation usually lasts uh, several lines at the beginning of these these epics, and and often the 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 muses are invoked to to uh, to guide the poet later on in the epic as well but at the beginning there's almost always a, a, an invocation of this sort so this is the beginning of the Iliad rage goddess sing the rage of Peleus son Achilles murderous doomed that cost the Achaeans countless losses so um, I can't remember if I mentioned this but Achaeans is another word that Homer uses for Greeks so Achaeans Argives are two different words for Greeks that uh, Homer will use basically interchangeably. The cost that cost the Achaeans countless losses, hurling down to the house of death so many sturdy souls, great fighter souls, but made their bodies carrion, feasts for the dogs and birds, and the will of Zeus was moving toward its end. Begin, muse, when the, the two first broke and clashed. Agamemnon, Lord of Men, and brilliant Achilles. What god drove them to fight with such a fury? Ah, Apollo, the son of Zeus and Leto. So, so the, uh, the epic invocation starts with, okay, sing muse of the rage of Achilles. Okay, so the first word of the epic is manus, which is rage, okay? Of rage, sing goddess. So uh, of the rage of Achilles, so to speak, uh, sing. Okay, so a couple of things there. Um, the invocation is asking for aid to tell this story from a muse because it's, uh, it's an experience that's outside of the ken of the poet. It's, it's going to describe the events, the actions of gods and goddesses that, the, that are beyond on human comprehension or human, normal human comprehension events that happened uh, in the dim past, the, these types of things that are beyond uh, the knowledge of the poet. Uh, so help me sing about this. And these events are usually caused by something or some God. Okay, so in this case, what drove them to such a fury? Apollo. Uh, and, and we have a similar invocation, I won't read this, but to the Odysseys, very similar again, sing to me of the man muse, okay, so the first word of the Odyssey is man or andros, and the first word of the Iliad is rage or manus. Um, so, so, all these epics in the tradition, as I said, they, they begin with, okay, I want to talk about this subject. And that subject led to, or which or who, uh, led to a lot of different struggles and strife. And then what was the cause, what, what God, what, uh, what the rage of which God was the, the, the spur of these, uh, of, of these events. So uh, in Homer, it's rage, which cost the Achaeans countless losses. 
and what God drove them. And then the Odyssey that the subject is, is, is Odysseus, the man of many turns, and who was driven off course. So it caused the suffering because of his, his wanderings and the cause was Poseidon's rage. Then Aeneid of Virgil, we're, we're gonna see that the subject is arms and the man. Uh, so it's, it's, it's kind of both the Iliad and the Odyssey. It's, it's the man, uh, which is the first word of the Odyssey, but also the arms, the, the rage of, of Aeneas, who was in exile hurl, hurl, hurled about endlessly at sea. And the cause was, uh, was uh, the rage of Juno in this case. Other conventions, uh, katabasis, which is Greek for downgoing, um, or uh, which is a journey to the underworld. Uh, there isn't a direct journey to the underworld in the Iliad, but in almost every epic there is. There are, uh, let's say, figurative descents to the underworld. We'll see that in book 24, Priam under, uh, undertakes kind of a figurative journey into the underworld. Uh, enumeratio, so is an enumeration or a, an epic list. So every epic have these long catalogs or genealogies. In, in the Iliad, there's a, an epic catalog of the ships that uh, uh, left from the different cities in, Greeks to, uh, in Greece to invade uh, Troy. And epic similes, we're going to come back to this uh, several times when we look at the Iliad. So really try to take note of this is is a, a, a simile, uh, is obviously a comparison using like or as. And um, uh, you know, we, we talked in the, the in introductory lecture on, on war in, in literature uh, about kind of the function of literature as to, to let us say, make us see things in a new way by using these poetic figures such as metaphor, and in this case, simile, to draw two things together that might not have seemed to be comparable previously. So the simile is one that does that using like or as. So a normal one, you know, a normal simile might be, you know, love is like a red rose, okay? So, so that's fine enough. Uh, you know, we've got the two terms, they've been compared by like or as. In an epic simile, because it has to be so expansive and it has to, has to basically flesh out every dimension and perspective of that culture, it's gonna tell the story behind that comparison and it's gonna bring in so many more details. So uh, here's a fictional one I've, I've put together that kind of expands on a love is like a red rose. As the roses that bloom on the sides of, I can't see this, of that hill where the great philosopher uh, would oft walk while discoursing, on free will and not for long forgetting that higher calling of a preordained root, so love blossomed in her in seeing the sight of, et cetera. So rather than just say it's like a rose, uh, the poet's gonna use that as an opportunity to say, like the rose that was in this story that you probably uh, kind of know faintly. And when so-and-so did that, and then they did this and then that, et cetera. And it fills up the word count too. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and if you're writing the essay, good one, Melody. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the the epic uh, the epic simile has to go beyond that kind of surface comparison and use it as a vehicle, a jumping off point to talk about the stories and the rich significance of those objects in the background. Here's an example from the Odyssey that's. Uh, that I, I like just because it's gross, I guess. I don't know, uh, and I apologize. Uh, warning, di viewer discretion. Um, from the Odyssey book nine, and, and remember I said it was in book nine during the recounting to the Phaeacians of his previous journeys that he talks about the episode with the Cyclops. Um, so the Cyclops is this huge um, beast that uh, has Odysseus and his men trapped in this cave, he's devouring them one by one. So they gotta figure out a way to get out of there. So uh, uh, Odysseus, uh, the man of twists and turns, uh, comes up with uh, a, an ingenious plot to get the uh, Cyclops drunk. And then while 
he's wandering around drunk. Uh, they're going to take a long, huge uh, shaft that they've sharpened and and put into a fire to make it red hot, and then they're going to shove it in his one eye to to blind him. So here's the uh, the narrative description of this. Straight forward, they sprinted, lifted it, and rammed it deep in his crater eye. And I leaned on it, turning it as, as a shipwright. So here's the, I've tried to highlight the simile components. Turning it as a shipwright, turns a drill in planking, having men below to swing the two-handled strap that pins it in the groove. So with our brand, we bored that great eye socket while blood ran out around the red hot bar. Eyelid and lash were seared. The pierced ball hissed, broiling, and the roots popped. In a smithy, so a, a blacksmith, uh, 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 a blacksmith's uh, work area there, one sees a white hot ax head or an adze. So these, these tools that the blacksmith's been working on and they're, they're white hot, plunged and wrung in a cold tub, screeching steam the way they make soft iron hail and hard, just so that eyeball hissed around the spike. So there's two similes going on there. He's compared, he's compared uh, driving the uh, shaft in to, to the operation of a shipwright. So putting, let's say, uh, spars or masts into a ship, they have to drive it through and screw it through holes in the ship's uh, structure that they've made. And someone below deck is, is twisting it around as well. So just as a shipwright does that, we we thrust our uh, our our that uh, that stick into the the eyeball, and it it was you know the eyeball obviously hissed in because of the 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 heat, and just as a, in a smithy, so with this blacksmith you can see a a white hot axe head when it's plunged into cold water, uh, screeching because of the steam just so that eyeball hissed. So the, the shaft itself is being compared on the one hand to Greek craftsmanship. And another Greek craft is compared to uh, the actual reaction of the eyeball. So in both cases, the, uh, this rather extraordinary act, like very few of us, I think, have blinded uh, mythological monsters, right? Hopefully, uh, hopefully this is not something that happens very much. So in the poem there, it's brought down to earth in terms of everyday things that you'd see every day. It's something that oh, I can I can probably wrap my mind around what that sounded like and what it looked like. Um, but also that it brings the heroic act into our own lived experience. You know, our own lived experience is also heroic if we're able to do these types of things. Um, so. Uh, so as I said there, I, I think I made the first point, you know, that it makes it more relatable. And then the other point I want to underscore is that is that the warriors in battle face death and and in in facing death, they're facing human finitude that we're all going to die. They face it in a very perspicuous way. They face it in a very obvious way. So the simile by taking that action and comparing it to our everyday lives reminds us that we're mortal as well. And reminds us that we have to find meaning in our limited existence as well. And in a way, the Homeric similes are, are reminding us that all of these acts of, of, of uh, kind of laboring through that, uh, uh, that day of, of banal chores because it's done in the in the in the let's say the background of finitude is heroic. So I'm going to quickly just uh, let you know a couple of these these ancient epics that are in the background. So there's the Epic of Gilgamesh that we know of. Um, it's the earliest poem to have come down to us in written form around 2000 before the Common Era, and in that poem, Gilgamesh is the king of Uruk and uh, is, is half human, half God, again, like Achilles, and he's supernaturally strong. Anu, uh, a, a God in this uh, Sumerian uh, 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 mythological worldview, creates the wild man in Kidu to challenge Gilgamesh, and they become, uh, they become friends. Enkidu, Enkidu dies, and Gilgamesh is grieving, and again, 
the driving motive of this epic, like the Iliad, like the Odyssey, is what do we do in the face of mortality? So I'm facing loss. Gilgamesh is grieving at the loss of his friend. Achilles will grieve at the loss of his friend Patroclus. Um, so Gilgamesh's response is to try to find the secret of immortality. And uh, despite long journeys and despite his divine strength, he's, at, he's powerless in the face of death. He, he, can't, he, he realizes he can't get the secret of immortality. And his, uh, his, his response basically at the end is that he's going to build these walls of, of Uruk that will stand the test of time. So his, his testament to having lived and his, his legacy will be the walls of the city. So the Iliad, uh, this kind of a very brief overview of what of the whole epic. So that when the epic begins, it's already be, uh, been raging for ten years. We begin with the anger of Achilles due to the fact that Agamemnon has taken his war prize Briseis, and we'll we'll look right into to why he had to do that in the in the next lecture on book one. Achilles uh, withdraws from the fighting, and the Greeks suffer losses. And then Achilles' uh, very dear friend Patroclus uh, dies at the hands of Hector. And Achilles' focus changes from his honor to revenge. He wants to get revenge on, on Hector. And he returns to the fighting. He slays Hector. Uh, and uh, at the end, Priam sneaks into the Greek camp uh, to beg for the return of his son's body. And on the right is uh, an image from this... Uh, uh, old older movie uh, called Troy with uh, Achilles played by Brad Pitt. If you want, it doesn't tell really the whole story of of the Iliad. It's it tells uh, it tries to bring together different legends. So it's got the Trojan horse there, which is not in the Iliad. It Achilles dies, which is not in the Iliad. So it tries to bring up the whole story, not just the Iliad. So this is. Uh, a map of, uh, of the Eastern Mediterranean. So you see Greece in the middle and you see circled there is the site of where Troy was um, on, on what is today Northern uh, Turkey. So the Odyssey, I'll just kind of recap that quickly. So the, the, in the first four books, uh, often called the Telemachia, it's about Odysseus' son, really, Telemachus. Who's, uh, who's there, home in Ithaca with Odysseus's wife, Penelope, and there's, we're presented with the danger posed by these suitors. So the suitors are uh, devastating their home. There's uh, over a hundred of them. And uh, in book five, uh, so, so finally Telemachus decides to take off and look for his, his father, who's been away for 20 years, right? So in book five, we first see Odysseus. It's the first time we see him in that uh, epic. And it's near the end of his travels and he's on the Isle of uh, Calypso, who's this powerful uh, magical nymph who's, who's uh, kept him captive there. Calypso offers him immortality, he refuses. So remember this is a central theme of all the epics is this question posed by the finding meaning in, more, in mortal existence. So for Gilgamesh, it was, well, I can't become immortal, so I'll, I'll try to create immortal walls or something that will live after me. Uh, Odysseus, I think wisely, uh, uh, most wisely of all the heroes, right from the get-go, realizes that uh, it's not human to be, it's not part of the lot for humans to live beyond their due portion, right? That immortality is not proper for mortals and that it would somehow rob them of their meaning, uh, of their existence. Uh, embracing that mortality is in a way a central theme of both the Iliad and the Odyssey. Uh, and then uh, he makes his way after he's freed from the Isle of uh, Calypso to the, the Isle of the Phaeacians. He narrates from books nine to 12, his adventures that had led him up there. Um, and then the last half of the Odyssey is about his uh, homecoming. And, and the first half is, you know, heroic tales of fighting Cyclops and, 
and others uh, encounters with gods and monsters. And the last half is very domestic and it's about dealing with human you know, troubles, political troubles, getting his family back together. And, and it's really this return home, so to speak, after 20 years of absence. So those are, um, say, a general introduction to epic as a genre, at least ancient epic as a genre that, that can guide our, our interpretation of, of Homer's Iliad. So today we talked about uh, as, a, as an introduction to Homer, we talked about why, why study Homer. We talked about um, the mythological background that's assumed in Homer. We talked about the Homeric question, uh, is, is Homer one or many authors? Did he, did he write or is it oral uh, composition? And then finally, we talked about epic genre, some of the conventions to expect, some of the, we talked quickly about some of the other ep ancient epics that we know of. So at that point, I'll close. Are there any questions or comments about the proceeding? Okay, seeing none, I will uh, see you for our, our next class. There's also a pre recorded lecture that's already ready for book one of Homer's Iliad. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.